Okay, this is another true story. I don't have to actually tell the story by words. I just said, "I'll see you later. I'll talk to you later." What I meant by that was I was gonna just get on. You know, I was gonna just、um, get going and start my day with other stuff instead of recording one more video. But、uh, I realized I've been skipping reading to the camera for another few days, and、um, so I want to restart. You know,、uh, I don't criticize myself. I don't feel frustrated about not being able to being consistent. Right? I can always start again. So any 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 page is good. You know. It's better than not reading at all. Page ninety. Work doesn't speak for itself. Close your eyes and imagine you're a wealthy collector who's just entered the gallery in an art museum. On the wall facing you, there are two gigantic canvases, each more than ten feet tall. Both paintings depict a harbor at sunset. From across the room, they look identical. The same shapes, the same reflections on water, the same sun at the sta- same stage. Of setting, you go in for a closer look. You can't find a label or a museum tag anywhere. You become obsessed with the paintings, which you nickname Painting A and Painting B. You spend an hour going back and forth from canvas to canvas, comparing brush strokes. You can't detect a single difference. Just as you go to fetch a museum guard or someone who can shed light on these mysterious twin masterpieces. The head curator of the museum walks in. You eagerly inquire as to the origins of your new obsessions. The curator tells you that painting A was painted in the 17th century by a Dutch master. And what of painting B? You ask. Ah,、oh, yes, painting B. The curator says, "That's a forgery. It was copied last week by a graduate student at a local art college." Look up at the paintings. Which canvas look better now? Which one do you want to take home? Art forgery is a strange phenomenon. You might think that the pleasure you get from a painting depends on its color and its shape and its pattern, says psychology professor Paul Bloom. And if that's right, it shouldn't matter whether it's an original or a forgery. But our brains don't work that way. When shown an object, or given a food, or shown a face, people's assessment of it, how much they like it. How valuable it is is deeply affected by what you tell them about it. In their book, Significant Objects, Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker recount an experiment in which they set out to test their this hypothesis. Stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's subjective value can actually be measured objectively. First, they went out to thrift stores. Fleet markets and yard sales, and bought a bunch of insignificant objects for an average of one dollar and twenty-five cents an object. Then they hired a bunch of writers, both famous and not so famous, to invent a story that attributed significance to each other. Finally, they listed each object on eBay using the invented stories as the object's description, and whatever they had originally paid for the object as the auction starting price. By the end of the experiment, they had sold one hundred twenty-eight dollars and seventy-four cents worth of trinkets for three thousand and six hundred and twelve dollars and fifty-five cents. Words matter. Artists love to trot out the tired line. My work speaks for itself, but the truth is, our work doesn't speak for itself. Human beings want to know where things came from, how they were made, and who made them. The stories you tell about the work you do have a few, huge effect on how people feel and what they understand about your work, and how people feel and what they understand about your work affects how they value it. Why should we describe the frustrations and turning points in the lab, or all the hours of grunt work and failed images that precede the final outcomes? Ask artist Rachel Sussman, because rarefied. Exceptions aside, our audience is a human one, and humans want to connect. Personal stories can make the complex more tangible, spark associations, 
and offer entry into things that might otherwise leave one cold. Your work doesn't exist in a vacuum, whether you realize it or not. You are already telling a story about your work. Every email you send, every text, every conversation, every blog comment, every tweet, every photo, every video. There are all bits and pieces of multimedia narrative you are constantly constructing. If you want to be more effective when sharing yourself and your work, you need to become a better storyteller. You need to know what a good story is and how to tell one. Oh my goodness, amazing! This is what I exactly wanted to hear. You know, last time I actually posted on social media before I turned off my phone. Because it was actually my one year anniversary of, you know, consistent meditation. Yeah, as a daily routine, I shared the first video I recorded myself meditating on WeChat moments, and my caption goes like, "A year ago today, meditating meditation every day. I have done meditation daily." Instead of saying "Happy One Year Anniversary," how about "One Year Anniversary Peaceful"? Like happy, happy. In,、uh, instead of happy, I feel peaceful. Okay, I guess that's the narrative I construct. I want more people to value being peaceful more. Okay, that's the message I want to send out. I want to. Associate my beingness with peacefulness more. When people think about me, they think about peacefulness. That's more important than happiness. Okay, because we all have different things to be happy. But、uh, I guess the same for peacefulness. But、uh, peacefulness can last longer, I guess. And I want peacefulness more. Okay. Yeah, I'm still in the process process of telling a better story. Yeah, every time is this experiment, and then I watch my own videos. I read my own journals. Right, I can learn from my work. Okay, man, I'm tired. I'm tired now. I'm going to sleep. I'm up. I'm going to take a shower and then start my bright new day. It's gonna be a great day.